Major funding for NJ Spotlight News is provided in part by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and by the PSCG Foundation. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, the Supreme Court hearing arguments on the abortion pill Mifepristone. Will the court limit abortion access here in New Jersey and across the country? This is the first major abortion case to be back in front of the Supreme Court since Dobbs was decided and since the Supreme Court declared that it was getting out of the business of abortion. Here we are just a couple years later with a case in front of them that has huge implications for access to medication abortion in this country. Plus, Governor Murphy renews the Transportation Trust Fund, guaranteeing infrastructure funding for the next five years. Also, thousands of bleeding control kits are being distributed to houses of worship here in the state amid a nationwide rise in hate crimes directed at religious communities. We hope that no one ever has to use one of these kits, uh, but the reality is that while law enforcement is out there uh, diligently trying to thwart these offense, um, we need to make sure people are prepared. And re-engaging Newark's youth. Mayor Roz Baraka officially opening a center to connect young people with educational and career opportunities. And so this center serves as an opportunity to kind of round those young people up, to give them options, to give them hope, uh, to not allow their uh, situation to be their destination. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Tuesday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. The fate of the abortion pill Mifepristone rests in the hands of the U.S. Supreme Court. Justices today heard oral arguments on whether to restrict access to the widely used drug, which is the most common method of abortion in the country. At the center of the dispute, a group of anti-abortion doctors and organizations challenging the Food and Drug Administration's more than two-decade-old approval of Mifepristone and the FDA's decisions over the past several years to increase access to the pill, including making it available by mail. A majority of the justices today appeared deeply skeptical about a nationwide ban and called into question whether the plaintiffs have the legal grounds or standing to bring the lawsuit, which is the most significant abortion case to go before the high court since Roe v. Wade was overturned in 2022, eliminating the nationwide right to abortion after nearly 50 years. If the court sides with the plaintiffs, it means access to Mifepristone would be limited even in states like New Jersey, where the right to abortion has been codified into state law. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. Hundreds gathered again before the U.S. Supreme Court to protest a crucial abortion access case less than two years after the conservative majority overturned Roe v. Wade. The court could roll back easy telemedicine access to Mifepristone, an FDA-approved drug used in two-thirds of medication abortions last year in the U.S., What's at stake? And again, when we always think about who is impacted. It's always going to be people that are marginalized that couldn't travel to access care and need the access to medication via telemedicine to be able to access abortion in their areas. And this ruling may prevent that from happening. Mifepristone's widely regarded as very safe and effective. During COVID, the FDA relaxed rules requiring an in-office exam to get the drug and made that permanent in 2021. Mail orders soared, but seven anti-abortion doctors sued, claiming that when patients who took the drug came into the ER with complications, it forced them to provide abortion health care against their conscience. This sort of complicity um, harm uh, from being involved in, in an elective uh, abortion, Your Honor. And again, these doctors performing a DNC uh, must scrape out a, a woman's uterus uh, of, of a child, of the embryo, the fetus, or placental tissue. And this court has recognized harms like that. 
But attorneys for the FDA and drug maker Danko Labs argued valid studies show a very small increase in complications. And several justices noted the law already offers individual doctors the right to refuse cases that violate their conscience. They're saying because we object to having uh, to be forced to participate in this procedure, we're seeking an order preventing anyone from having access to these drugs at all. And I guess I'm just trying to understand how they could possibly be entitled to that, given the injury that they have alleged. I agree, Justice Jackson, and I do think it's relevant to standing. There's a profound mismatch here between the claimed injury and the remedy they were seeking. And this case seems like a, a prime example of turning what could be a small lawsuit into a nationwide legislative assembly on on, on, a, on a, an FDA rule or any other federal government action. Justice Barrett questioned whether prescribing the drug without a doctor's visit could miscalculate how far along a pregnancy had progressed since mifepristone can only be used until 10 weeks. FDA's ultimate conclusion was that mifepristone could safely be dispensed without in-person visits. It had voluminous evidence, I think, to support that conclusion in 2021, and there's been no contrary evidence that's been introduced. So there was no requirement of either an ultrasound or um, detecting a fetal heartbeat or anything like that, even before the doctor could just go based on the woman's recounting when her last menstrual period was. That's right, and that dates all the way back to the initial approval of this drug in 2000. But attorneys for the anti-abortion doctors also challenged the FDA's methods and statistics. Justice Alito hammered drug maker Danko Labs' attorney. Uh, you think the FDA is infallible? No, Your Honor, we don't think that at all. And we don't think that question is really teed up in, in any way in this case. But the drug has been marketed by mail to states which have enacted abortion bans since the court overturned Roe. Alito asked whether that violated the Comstock Act, a so-called dead law which prohibits mailing contraceptives, or state statutes. Does your company think that what the FDA has done preempts state laws that prohibit the dispensation of mifeprestone within their borders. We have not taken a position on that issue in this case. But this is not a case about Comstock, right? This is a case about the FDA and the decisions that the FDA made. Rutgers Law Attorney Kim Murchison says the court continues to question federal authority, but it got little traction today. The focus remains on mifeprestone. We're just arguing about whether we should roll back the changes that have been made um, over time to make it more um, accessible. The legal case reverberates across political lines as the U.S. heads towards a raucous election where abortion tops many campaign debates. Senator Cory Booker tweeted, This Congress needs to act to protect the right of access to life-saving abortion. And if this Congress does not act, we must get new Congress people that will. The court's expected to rule on the case in June. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. The pot of money that pays for maintaining New Jersey's transportation infrastructure gets to live for another five years after Governor Murphy today signed a bill renewing the state transportation trust fund. But in order to keep it in good standing, the administration will raise the gas tax by about two cents a year and charge a new fee for electric vehicle owners. Senior political correspondent David Cruz has the details. I can say that this is now the law of yeah. the land. It was business as usual for Governor Phil Murphy today, celebrating the comparatively easy lift that became the effort to reauthorize the Transportation Trust Fund. We're going to invest billions of dollars into New Jersey's Transportation Trust Fund so we can keep our transportation system in tip-top shape. This funding will cover the cost of maintenance and repairs for everything, from roads and highways to bridges and tunnels, to railroads and runways. Your tax dollars at work, in other words, roughly two cents a gallon on your gas annually for the next five years, and new registration fees for electric vehicles, starting at $250 and increasing annually up to $290. Worth every penny, says Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin. And you can tell a lot about the importance of legislation. Well, first of all, when the governor shows up and then when TV cameras show up, you know this is a really big deal. Uh, and that's what it is today. It really truly is a big deal. 
uh, and we have where we have business and labor coming together, Democrats and Republicans coming together, people from across the state coming together to recognize how important this is for the future of New Jersey. It did not have to go down. One of the one of the ridiculous pieces of spin coming out of the Murphy administration is, well, we wanted to get this done so it didn't interfere with the budget process. Well, that's BS. It should have been an integral part of the budget process. Uh, so being part of the budget process is an asset, not a bug. Uh, so it's a ridiculous line of, of, ra of, of tortured rationale. Uh, it could have waited. It could have waited until the end of budget season. We are not out of cash in the TTF. Uh, there's no urgency here. This is happening urgently just because they want to get it done quickly before the public has a real chance to get their head around it, uh, do another tax increase in addition to the billions of tax increases that are included in the budget. For the governor, it was also his first appearance before the press since his wife dropped out of the race for U.S. Senate. It didn't seem like the first thing he wanted to talk about, but you got to ask. If you could characterize the conversations that you had with the First Lady regarding her recent decision. Nothing on private conversations, David. You won't be surprised by that. So I'm, not, I'm neither the principal nor her manager, but I'm incredibly proud of her. Um, she went into this for the right reasons. She stood for the right things. She worked her tail off. And it was a really tough decision for her. There's very few people in this line of business who put party over self. And that's exactly what she did. Incredibly, incredibly proud of her. He's also heard some of those out there starting to use the term lame duck when describing him. I, I, when I see those headlines, I laugh. I, I noticed they didn't come from you, so I was gratified. To, uh, at least not yet. Yeah. Uh, we're sprinting through the tape. You got you. Uh, if you looked at my schedule right now, you would literally laugh at that statement with me. We've got a lot more road to cover, and uh, I'm running around the state today, yesterday, tomorrow, you name it. With some weight off his shoulders, the governor appears geared up for a budget season that could see some choppy waters. No place for a lame duck. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. New Jersey is on track to set new records for bias incidents, according to preliminary data from the State Office of Homeland Security, which earlier this month issued a report showing anti-Muslim, anti-Arab and anti-Semitic incidents are on the rise. Officials say there's no specific threat right now, but they want soft targets of domestic terrorism to be prepared for the worst, providing houses of worship throughout the state with so-called bleeding kits, packages of medical supplies to help victims in the event of an active shooter. Organizations tell Melissa Rose Cooper they hope they'll never have to use the kits, but they're grateful for the tools and training should they need it. It's a sad that we have to in this world, you know, in uh, uh, times we have to do that. But uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, you don't want this to be happen. But things are do happening, you know, across the nation, I will say, uh, and the whole world uh, at large, you know. So it's better to be prepared. If we can even save one life, uh, that's important. Harjinda Kahal, secretary for the Board of Trustees at Guru Nanak Mission in Oakland, emphasizing the need to be able to act fast in case a Sikh temple is faced with a violent attack. A little more than 10 years ago, uh, incident happened in Wisconsin, uh, Gurdwara. Uh, there was a, a active shooting there. Uh, people get die died because of that, and uh, it's important uh, in case of uh, mass casualty. You know, when somebody is bleeding, if somebody has been taken care of within few minutes, you know, stop the bleeding. Uh, their chances of survival are good. So Kahal is happy to have taken part in one of the state's first training sessions, teaching houses of worship to properly use bleeding control. Kids. The program is part of the New Jersey Office of Homeland and Security's counterterrorism and preparedness missions. We've administrated uh, grant programs that help them procure target hardening equipment, security personnel, and training resources. We've provided them with security briefings. Uh, we've conducted risk assessments and also provided uh, specifically active shooter response training. So the bleeding control kit distribution is just another facet of these efforts. Uh, 
with what we're doing with Houses of Worship across the state. More than 7,000 kits will be distributed to about 6,400 places of worship across New Jersey as part of the program. While there are no specific threats at this time, Charles Ambio, Preparedness Division Director for the NJO HSP, says the goal is to be proactive instead of reactive. We hope that no one ever has to use one of these kits, uh, but the reality is that while law enforcement is out there uh, diligently trying to thwart these events, um, we need to make sure people are prepared. And should an event occur or an incident occur, uh, we want to equip houses of worship with every resource in our toolbox to help them mitigate and respond to a threat. According to the NJOHSP, statistics show domestic extremists and homegrown violent extremists carried out 16 attacks on soft targets like churches, schools, and transit systems across the country between 2018 and 2022, resulting in 60 deaths and 66 injuries. I think the threat's always been there. I just think more people are recognizing it. Thomas Michaels, Chief Security Officer for the Jewish Federation of Greater Metro West, New Jersey, says the kits are critical in saving lives since every second counts. Because when law enforcement comes right, they have one job to do and the, and it can't be safe. Um, it has to be safe before that for that medical task force to come in behind them. So that little gap in between is that's where this bleeding control kits for congregants, for the people that are on the scene that can that can make that in, that can do the intervention and save lives. And, and honestly, they could save their, and you could save yourself because part of the training is applying tourniquets to yourself. Even though Kahal says the temple hasn't faced any significant threats, he's glad the bleeding control kits are available. One less worry, so worshipers can pray in peace. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. The South Orange Maplewood School District is in hot water again, this time for landing on a growing list of public schools and universities under federal investigation for alleged discrimination. According to NJ.com, which first reported the story, the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights launched a probe last week. No word on whether the investigation is focusing on anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, for example, but it comes roughly a week after the district caught heat for sending out a document about Ramadan that was accused of being inflammatory and containing anti-Semitic language. The school system has had other recent incidents of alleged bias. The principal of Columbia High School was arrested earlier this month on charges of endangering the welfare of a child, which allegedly involved a black female student. And in December, police investigated anti-Semitic threats written on a girl's bathroom stall at the same high school. South Orange Maplewood joins Rutgers Newark, Newark Public Schools, and Teaneck School District in the federal department's investigations of bias. Well, the recent federal study crowned New Jersey with an undesirable distinction as the most dangerous state in the nation for pedestrians. According to an analysis by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, pedestrians account for 30 percent of those killed in fatal accidents in the Garden State. Congressman Josh Gottheimer today announced a new pedestrian safety strategy using roughly $2 million in federal money to build things like crosswalks, pedestrian bridges, and safe for sidewalks throughout North Jersey. Meanwhile, in Camden County this week, the attorney general announced a new traffic safety program to prevent deaths along one of the state's most dangerous roads, the White Horse Pike, where, according to state data, there have been more than 11,000 crashes over the last decade and a half. Ted Goldberg reports on the plan and why safety officials believe it'll help. If you've ever driven or walked along Whitehorse Pike and thought it seemed like a dangerous road, you're not wrong. Since January of 2010, there have been 11,251 crashes on the Whitehorse Pike in Camden County. Of those crashes, 3,894 caused injuries, which included 158 serious injuries and 80 fatalities. Eight people died last year from crashes on Whitehorse Pike, so expect to see more police here over the next six months. Thanks to $400,000 in federal funds, the dozen or so police departments along this road will be able to pay overtime so officers can monitor this road. And there will be a noticeable increase in police presence along the Whitehorse Pike. And we are asking everyone to be conscious of their surroundings, drive safely and carefully, to assist us in accomplishing our goals of safer roadways for our residents. 
According to police, more than half of accidents on this road involve driver inattention or driver distraction. So as much as you can expect police to give out more tickets on this road, there's also an educational component here. Distracted driving and aggressive driving is not just another statistic. It is a harsh reality that we must confront immediately before another life is lost. I have extended invitations to traffic safety partners across this region who are eager to contribute by raising awareness in your community and in your schools. Potential danger can be avoided by drivers and pedestrians simply by being aware of their surroundings. Situational awareness is crucial. We all have times when we're late to work or to an appointment or to pick up or drop off our kids. We're all human. Deaths from traffic accidents aren't unique to Camden County. State data says 621 people were killed across New Jersey last year. A figure that includes people in cars, pedestrians, and bicyclists. While this was less than the previous year, it's still far too many. We want that number to be zero. Drivers, passengers, pedestrians, and bicyclists deserve to be able to travel safely. We must instill in ourselves and future generations the importance of committing our individual attention while driving. We must educate ourselves and our loved ones about the dangers of distracted driving and the devastated impact it can have. As far as the percentage of traffic deaths, about 30% of all traffic deaths are bicyclists and pedestrians. And yet we spend only a tiny fraction of our transportation dollars on making these roads safer. John Boyle is the research director for the Bicycle Coalition of Greater Philadelphia. He's well aware of the dangers posed to people biking on Whitehorse Pike. There is a tendency for drivers to speed through there. Um, and on the flip side, there are absolutely no accommodations for bicyclists and pedestrians along this road. He would also like to see physical changes to this road, something not addressed by this new initiative. For it to be sustainable, um, we need to have something that slows, just slows the cars down and make it easier for people to walk or bike along and across. The initiative lasts for six months. Camden County Prosecutor Grace McCauley says the best way to measure success is simple. Whether or not there are fewer accidents and fewer people getting killed on this dangerous stretch of road in the county. In Waterford Township, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. In our Spotlight on Business report, state regulators have made a new commitment to studying how offshore wind development will impact ocean life. The Murphy administration on Monday announced $3.7 million in funding for scientific research into the ecological effects of the industry, including studies into how whales, sea turtles and birds move through the areas where offshore wind projects are currently planned. Wind energy is a cornerstone of New Jersey's efforts to stave off the worst effects of climate change. A string of high profile whale strandings last year became fodder for anti wind groups, but scientists have said there is no evidence linking the whale deaths to offshore wind development. On Wall Street, stocks moved higher today as markets try to recover from back-to-back -back losses. Here's today's closing trading numbers. And in Newark, an opportunity to turn lives around. Across the city, nearly 4,000 youth between the ages of 16 and 20 aren't in school. And according to city data, another 3,000 are at risk of leaving without a high school diploma. Advocates say a majority have experienced violence or other trauma. Well, Mayor Roz Baraka and other community groups today opened what they're calling a re-engagement center to reconnect at-risk youth with education programs leading to a diploma and future career paths. The new hub will be geared toward residents aged 13 to 24, so even those who've aged out of the city schools can be referred to get a GED or have other similar options. The center will also give participants school placement and guidance services, social support, and wraparound services, all to help them in and out of the classroom. 
in education, there must be an entry level point for everybody. And everybody doesn't enter the same space the same way. So we're creating entry points for folks to get into the space they need to be in. And maybe they can't take the stairs. They need to go up the ramp, right? Maybe they can't go up the ramp. They need to get a lift, right? And so all of those things we are putting in place here in this re-engagement center to make sure young people can access opportunity and access education uh, differently, but the destination is the same. And that does it for us tonight. But don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Brianna Venosi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. Have some water. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member. NJM Insurance Group has been serving New Jersey businesses for over a century. As part of the Garden State, we help companies keep their vehicles on the road, employees on the job, and projects on track. Working to protect employees from illness and injury, to keep goods and services moving across the state. We're proud to be part of New Jersey. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. If you need to see a doctor, RWJ Barnabas Health has two easy ways to do it from anywhere. You can see an urgent care provider 24-7 on any device with our Telemed app. Or use our website to book a virtual visit with an RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group provider or specialist, even as a new patient. You've taken every precaution, and so have we. So don't delay your care any longer. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.